There are definitely some different jobs out there for PAs and NPs, and one of those jobs is working in correctional facilities. I'm not really sure if I would want to work in correctional medicine or not. There's a lot of unknowns there for me. So today I'm going to talk to a PA. His name is Vivek, and he's been working in correctional facility, actually as a locums provider, for many months now. And he's going to kind of tell us how it all works. So stay tuned to hear what he has to say and find out what you think about correctional medicine. Thank you, Vivek, for being here on the channel today. It's a pleasure having you here. It's nice to be here. First of all, are you in like a federal prison? Are you in a, a, a federal, I don't even know what they call them, but what kind of yeah. facility are you in? So, you know, I didn't know any of these things, the nuances between jail and prison and, you know, corrections facility and what actually all that means. So I'm at a facility that's a state facility. Okay. So it's a prison, it's a holding uh, facility, as well as a jail. So for example, you know, if somebody is found to be publicly intoxicated and they get put into a drunk tank, um, that's a holding facility. So they'd hold them until they're, you know, they're sober, and then they would either process them or they, you know, discharge them back into the community. Then you have a jail where people are awaiting sentencing, they're awaiting, um, you know, their trial. And then lastly, once they are sentenced, then they, you know, serve their, their sentence and that's prison. So I'm at an all-male facility. Okay. There is an all-female facility that I haven't, you know, been asked to go to. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, we will have female incarcerated individuals. And so sometimes they will need care while they're in holding, awaiting to go to the all-female facility, okay. for example. If you're working corrections, you're not going to be seeing peds. So what's the age range that you see? So the age range typically is from 18 to as, as old as, you know, patients can be. Typically, the cutoff ends up being around 72 to 75 years of age. And at our facility, we don't have a fully functioning infirmary. So we're not able to care for, you know, patients who are on dialysis, patients who have CHF, they have complicated chronic medical conditions. Uh, we're not able to care for those. So, you know, that 65 year old patient that we do get, maybe they have hypertension, maybe they're on a statin and they're kind of following up every six months or so just to make sure that their antihypertensives are working. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Other than those, those few people in holding where you might see a female from time to time, usually people, I guess, either work at a women's facility or at a male facility. Do you know if they are always separated male and female? I believe they are, at least in the state of Vermont. And I think that's a Department of Corrections thing. I just was thinking about like, if you don't want to deal with OBGYN, you know, issues, then you can find just a male, male only facility. Now, are, are, when you work in a prison, are you only taking care of the inmates or do you also take care of, of guards and people that work in the prison? It's just the inmates. Okay. So there, there is an obligation that you know, incarcerated individuals have a right to care. I think a big question people might have with corrections is how dangerous are the people I'm dealing with? From your sure. experiences so far, what, what do you have to say about that? Well, the, the range of the charges can be anywhere from trespassing to unlawful, you know, possession of a vehicle to attempted murder to murder in the first degree, as well as manslaughter and then anything in, in between. But the best way to go about it, from my perspective, is to sort of maintain the objectivity that we're not there to discuss why you're here. Yeah. We're really there to discuss how can I make your stay more comfortable from a medical perspective. Yeah. And how have you found the prisoners to be? Do you find them fairly res respectful and well-behaved? Or do you have you encountered a lot of attitude or insult or anything that scared you? Yeah, I, I would say yes to all of them. But there, there's definitely a lot more to be said in, in all of the categories. There are definitely challenges. People have a difficult time. It's not the best place to be by any means. And people have mental health issues and they have mental health crises sometimes. And so there's unpleasantness that can that can come out, you know, certain language, you know, profanity, raising the voice. But there's a very concerted effort to protect everybody, including the incarcerated individuals. And so there's a very low tolerance for exceedingly or progressively worsening agitated or aggressive behavior in a patient encounter. 
So if a patient starts to raise their voice at me and they start using profanity that's directed at me or insult, I don't have to continue that encounter. It's appropriate to end that encounter, get some space. Maybe if, if I feel like the patient's having a mental health crisis, get mental health involved. You know, a lot of times patients will have uh, paranoia. Maybe they become manic and there's a certain, you know, slew of affect that, that is associated with that. So I think it's made me a much better diagnostician and much better history taker because a lot of times it's not, it's impossible to corroborate a story. You know, a patient might come in and it might be a 27 year old male who's never had any, you know, back injuries reportedly, and there's never been any fracture history, never surgical history. And they're looking for, you know, gabapentin or Lyrica, for example. And it's, I have to decipher, you know, do they need it? You know, and how do you actually determine that when you don't have medical records for historian and you're in a setting where there's absolutely all the incentive to, to have diversion of medication. Right. When you're seeing the, the patients, are they restrained or in handcuffs at all? Or what is that scenario like? Are you in a separate little room? Are there other people in there? Or is it just you and the inmate? So there's different areas to provide care. So there is something called, uh, you know, SMU um, or, or the SHU, so like secure housing unit where, you know, say something happens like they're caught with contraband and, and maybe they're, you know, resisting going into their, uh, you know, their cell, for example, and they get brought in for disciplinary reason, you know, and, and they get, say, they get into an altercation and oftentimes there's a lot of unwitnessed injuries. And so it might be, you know, I punch the wall and, you know, they're in, in a secure holding unit and they're kind of, you know, being penalized for, for whatever alleged bad behavior. And I have to go in and evaluate them for a wrist fracture, for example, or a boxer's fracture. And so I'll do, you know, a cell side, we call it a cell side physical exam and do an H and P there and kind of, you know, formulate a treatment plan. And I'll often have a C a correction officer there with me. Are you examining through the bars? Are you in the cell with them? Or are they out of the cell? So oftentimes in a secure, you know, holding unit, they will be in the cell and there's a little slot of a door that opens up. Okay. And so most times I'm able to evaluate them through that. I make it my best effort to try not to open the door and go into the cell, not because I'm concerned uh, about my safety or I'm necessarily intimidated or I'm anxious, it's more to kind of diffuse the situation the best I can. Oftentimes it's a very heated situation. There's a lot of conflict associated with the correction officer team or the department of correction team and the incarcerated individual. The last thing I wanna do is kind of intensify yeah. <laughs> th that interaction. And so I tried my best to kind of mellow the whole situation out. And I try to use my best professional and compassionate voice to kind of try to relay the message that, look, I'm on your side here. I'm here to help you. Whatever's going on with DOC and you, that's between you and DOC. It has nothing to do with me. I'm at the bottom of that totem pole. You know, besides doing the cell side visits, what other kind of settings are you? So I have a provider room where there's a, you know, exam table. There's, you know, all of the things that I need, autoscope, you know, physical exam stuff, blood pressure cuff, you know, stethoscopes things for, you know, dressing changes. A typical day for me would be, you know, I go in and I, I try to touch base with the nurses, you know, hey, is there anything going on? You know, is, is anybody complaining of anything, anything that needs to be signed out to me, addressed first thing in the morning? That's usually the first hour, hour and a half of my day is kind of just catching up on all of the things from overnight. And so there is an overnight provider that's not on site. And then sometimes, you know, people will go to the hospital you know, somebody's having chest pain, they have to send them to the hospital, then I have to do a return from the hospital eval from them. Somebody might be in the infirmary, maybe they had a recent surgical procedure, and I have to basically do my rounds and, and into the facility. Then I start addressing and calling patients up. And so typically the way it is, is I'll call the unit and there's a unit officer in the unit and I'll call and say, hey, you know, can I get Mr. Smith up here to medical, please? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the provider. And then Oftentimes, if Mr. Smith is not having any behavioral issues and there's no, you know, diversion history, he'll come up by himself and I'll evaluate them. And, you know, it's very professional. It's calm. And I'll call them up and say, hey, you know, I called you up for chronic care appointment. 
We last saw you for your blood pressure. You know, I saw that, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the blood pressure was going up. You know, what happened? You know, I think I missed my dose. I was having a hard time. So then we'll kind of go over a treatment plan. And then that's a typical, you know, interaction. How would you know to, to call this particular patient? So there's t- the three tiers of triaging and patient care. So the first uh, tier is called six slip. So, you know, just like in the community, if you were, you know, hey, I'm having intense abdominal pain, I'm having nausea, vomiting, I got to call my doctor. That's where, you know, they will get to the on-call provider through nursing. But, you know, if it's, hey, I'm having a lot of teeth issue, I'm, you know, can you put me on an antibiotic? I think I have a dental abscess, for example, until I can go see the dentist and have my teeth pulled. We do have a sick call nurse, but sometimes you know, there, there's a lot of sick calls and sometimes they're not able to fulfill those needs. So we'll kind of step in and say, you know, Mr. Smith again has a chronic care appointment coming up. We need to talk about his blood pressure medication, but he's got three other sick slips. Maybe he's having a back issue. Maybe he's having a dental issue. And maybe he's looking to, you know, speak to the psychiatrist and go up on his Seroquel, for example. So that would be, you know, okay, let's discuss those things. I'm going to take care of those sick slips for you. We're going to do this chronic care appointment. That's, you know, the two of the three I described. The third kind is called, you know, periodic history and physical or initial history and physical. So when, you know, incarcerated individuals first come in, just like we do in the community, we have to do a history and physical, figure out their healthcare needs, their follow-up needs, their referral needs. Yeah, I guess I didn't think about that, but say you had somebody who was is getting treatment for, let's stick with the diabetes, you know, they're on metformin, they're in the community, they get arrested and they're in holding, a, awaiting trial and things. I, I guess at that point they have to be evaluated and someone has to start their medicine in the in the jail. I mean, same thing when people have been sentenced elsewhere and they come into the prison. We have about a seven day leeway when somebody first comes in because of COVID and quarantine, you know, it just wasn't safe to see patients right away when they came in. Um, So fortunately, you know, we have nursing and so they are able to do what's called an initial assessment. And so they do their, the med reconciliation right then and there. So, you know, say somebody's on Eliquis, we put them right on Eliquis right away. You know, somebody's on a baby aspirin, all of the essential medications they get right away. On TV and movie stuff, we always see the patients lining up to, and they take their med- medication in front of somebody. Is that really how it works? Or do they do, are they able to have medicine in their cells? So that's called keep on person or KOP, when, you, when you're able to keep it on your person in, in the cell. That used to be a thing. Then I believe there were a few instances where people took medication more than they should have, and there were some adverse effects. And so for security reasons, the KOP was discontinued. What happens is, yeah, exactly. There's a corrections officer. There's a nurse that it's, you know, there's a window and they have their med cart and then they kind of crush it up. They have this little machine and they put it into applesauce and then they have to, you know, take it. And then the officer has to, you know, verify that they they swallowed it. Interesting. I didn't know they would all have to go in applesauce. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. And so they have to crush it so that, you know, to, to discourage diversion. When you were seeing patients like in that provider room, it, it's just you and the patient or is there still always a guard or somebody in there? Yeah. So it depends. Sometimes there's a list or not. Sometimes there's always a list of patients who are having disciplinary issues. It's not safe for them to be with medical staff alone. So they need a chaperone and you get that list every day. It's emailed to you from the superintendent's office and you know, okay, Mr. Smith has to have a corrections officer with him. Can't see him alone today. Who, If they're not on the list, it, it's okay to see them. You'll get to know patients just like you do in the community. And so you're able to kind of gauge a little bit more. Okay, look, you know, Mr. Smith is having a hard time. Wasn't on this list of, you know, needs an escort. He's on a list of escorts now. What's going on? Let's collaborate with mental health. Can we help him out? Yeah, and that was something I was going to say earlier when you mentioned mental health. Do you, does the facility you're in they have they have separate mental health that's always available? Yes, there's two mental health counselors available every day, five days a week. We have a psych provider as well. They he rounds twice a week, and then he does telemedicine psych with them, where they will have uh, the mental health counselor be the chaperone with the patient. And then they will go over their their psych prescriptions and, and things like that. And they'll have their own office visit as well. And everybody has a list of patients and it's sort of automatically cued for you. So it could be done through that initial assessment where, you know, patients not on a psych medication, for example, they don't need to see psych. If they're on a psych medication, 
they'll get a you know referral for psych and it comes up in their queue. And so oh. we have a queue that we have to sort of address on a day-to-day -day basis. Roughly how many patients are you seeing on, on, a, on a typical shift? I, I, your shifts are eight hours or 10 hours? What, what kind of schedule do you work? It's pretty flexible. You know, if I wanted to, I could do five eights. If I wanted to, I could do three twelves. If I wanted to do, I, I do four tens. So I do four tens. Oh, okay. And so it's, it's great. I think that's the perfect time for me. It's an intense environment. And so doing 12 hours in that intense environment, it's tough. You know, it comes with challenges. There's a lot of barriers. For example, you might be calling a patient up. You know, I've got this initial health assessment that I need to do. Let me call this patient up. And then 10 minutes will go by and it might be, okay, it's time for chow, meaning it's time for lunch or breakfast or dinner. So that's not a good time right now. Six times a day, they do count. So not available during that time. Then if there's a lockdown, you know, there, say there's an altercation in, in the yard during rec time, all shut down, it's an emergency. Everybody goes in their cell, nobody goes in and out at all. All visitation is ended for, for, for the interim. And then until they can, until Department of Corrections can handle the situation, you're kind of on standby. So there's those hours that can go by where you're not able to see as many patients as you'd like. So it, it ranges, it could be eight patients a day, Sometimes if I'm lucky, it could be 20 patients a day. See, for me, that would be opposite. It'd be sometimes there's 20 patients, but if I'm lucky, there's eight patients. <laughs> well, there, there's a lot to be done. There, there's just a lot of care that needs to be provided. And so oftentimes if I go by the nurse's station and they've got three patients in there and they're all kind of doing different, different things, you know, they'll say, hey, you know, can you come take a look at this dressing? You know, how's it look to you? Can you come and take a look at this, you know, dental abscess? You know, what do you think? So there's a lot of those quick, quick patients as well. And we're a little spoiled where nursing can kind of document that, put in our prescriptions for us. And so it frees up a little bit of time to kind of run through patients and kind of, you know, do quick triage. There are other barriers too, like things you have to think about that make it stressful as far as like what kind of equipment you can have to work with and what's available and what you have to pay attention to that is in the vicinity of the, the prisoner. Can you tell us more about that? A typical challenge would be, I want to offer somebody a cortisone injection. We don't have an on-site x-ray, but in, in, unless I look at their x-ray, I'm not able to do that. So I have to wait for that x-ray to kind of be obtained. Um, you know, blood work, working in a hospital setting, super spoiled blood work available within 15 minutes, 20 minutes, everything is stat as far as you're concerned. Okay. Now it's a little bit different. Um, so, you know, if somebody comes in and they say, you know, I think I'm having abdominal pain, love to get, you know, LFTs, not so easily done. So makes you a little bit of a better diagnostician, makes you, you know, a little bit better at the physical exam. So there's ways to overcome challenges as well, I think. And, and you can certainly and absolutely still deliver standard of care. So what kind of things are different in corrections as far as, as the utensils are, the tools that you use and what you can have in the room with you? So no metal at all. All sharps have to be locked away under lock and key. If I want to, you know, give somebody an injection, I have to have nursing sign that out, have that, you know, documented my log. And then if there's any missing, you know, needles, sharps, things like that, facility goes on lockdown. And until that is found, nobody goes anywhere until that can be recovered. Uh, you know, there's other things that you're not able to so easily have access to. You know, injections is a big one. Medications are kind of tough as well. You know, drawing up those injections. There are certain braces that are not available. Any brace that has a metal piece in it, it's not allowed. And so they have to be special ordered from, you know, that's DOC approved, for example. You absolutely cannot bring in anything. You cannot bring in your cell phone. You cannot bring in your own, you know, pens, pencils, all bags that you bring in have to be a clear bag. You can bring your lunch. That's fine. You just can, you know, put it away in, in um, the provider break room that we have. No metal utensils. So <laughs> all, all plastic, no uh, metal water bottles, all plastic, absolutely no glass whatsoever. What about things like, like forceps and tweezers and staples, anything that we use? So suture removal kits, Kelly clams, bedside procedure uh, stuff, you know, scalpels, they're all locked away in a specific bag where it's locked into a, you know, an enclosed cabinet kind of a thing. And the bag itself has a lock on it as well. So there's, it's double locked and it's documented and logged every single day. 
to make sure that there's no sharps missing. When you talk about kind of a stressful environment and how many hours you can work, I think it's just that extra layer. You have to be even more aware situationally than you would in just a regular practice, right? Yeah, and, and planning and organization is a big one. You know, you you have to, ca- so, you know, I would have to go to nursing. I'd have to get all my equipment. I have to kind of carry it on my person through a hallway where I may or may not encounter, you know, a patient. And so there's always a certain level of concern in that regard. And what about if you need a specialist, if you if you think that the patient needs to be sent somewhere or see somebody else, how does how is that handled? Usually you're able to provide an outside referral. So there's a community hospital uh, within 10 minutes away from the facility. So if we have to send anybody to the ER, for example, that's how we do it. Earlier, you said something about DOC protocols. Do they have algorithms and, and ways that they really want something managed? And are, are you able to differ from that? Or do you have to pretty much follow what they set down? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of communication that happens. There's a morning meeting every day where DOC kind of dishes out rules and regulations that they'd like everybody to oblige. And there's a lot of protocols. If medical makes a decision like, I really think this patient should be in the infirmary, they won't fight you on it a whole lot. But there's that understanding that they know better about their operations than you do. So if they say, I respectfully disagree with you there, okay, that's the way it has to be. Fair enough. So we, we've talked a lot about different aspects of corrections, and I don't even know all of the questions to ask. So why don't you tell us if there's been things that have been kind of surprising insights for you or just things you never thought about when it comes to corrections? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that really jumped out at me initially was, you know, how difficult it is for some people um, to, to actually be functional in the community. You know, I think a lot of us end up taking that for granted that we have stable homes that we grow up in. We have mentors that sort of guide us along our career paths and our professional paths. And we sort of somehow are able to land on our feet. And a lot of times I think, you know, people who end up becoming incarcerated individuals, it's very difficult for them to function in the community. It's very difficult for them to hold down a job. I think mental health is a big, big problem and it's a big contributor to that. I do think that there's a tremendous amount of poly substance abuse that ends up becoming criminalized for better or for worse. That, that's sort of a completely separate you know, conversation, but I, it, nonetheless, you do experience it. And, and it's difficult where somebody has you know, such a strong propensity for uh, substance abuse that, you know, it's hard for them to actually recover. Those were definitely some of the surprises for me, because again, I think we really take that stuff for granted. The basic activities of daily living and our functional status, it comes very easy to us. And so I think it's definitely made me very compassionate. And that kind of was one of the questions I had thought about too, is what kind of personalities do well working in corrections, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, having a, a, an open mind and, and really genuinely trying to sort of walk away from biases um, that, and, and it's not so easy, right? When, when you have somebody that's very aggressive and very hostile towards you, it's very difficult to kind of remain calm and, and treat them with respect because they're not treating you with respect. But you know, I think what I try to do is keep in mind that it, it's not so easy for them to keep their calm. And so if, if I could be the calming presence in that and, and be flexible, you know, uh, it's okay to engage in conflict resolution while understanding, look, this isn't your fault. It's not the patient's fault. It's a difficult situation. We're all in it together and kind of reiterating the fact that I'm on your team. I had a great conversation and interview with Vivek, and we talked a lot about him working in corrections, but we also talked about his experiences working locums, so much so that I decided to divide the video up. And so this video was about corrections, but I will have another video with him where he talks all about locums, how he made the transition from surgical specialty to primary care in locums, and all he's learned about contract negotiations and salary and some of the ins and outs about locums. As soon as that video comes out, I will post it here at the end. And I'll also have here the video I did about my experiences working locums. Comment down below. 
Tell me what you think about corrections medicine, if it's something that you would ever consider or if you think it just sounds far too scary. Don't forget to like the video if you liked it and hit that subscribe button. It really does help me out.